This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, today we're going to be talking about really the expansion of being successful as an author, as well as some of the other streams that you can monetize yourself, be get uh, more monies coming in, what, what opportunities are out there, how do you make programs, and just a variety of things that go along with the author who wants to be seriously successful. With me for the hour is Stephanie Chandler. She's the author of several books, including the nonfiction book marketing plan, online and offline promotional strategies to build your audience and sell more books, something we all would like to do. She's also the founder and CEO of the Nonfiction Authors Association, which is an educational community for experienced and aspiring writers, and the Nonfiction Writers Conference, which is an annual event that's conducted entirely online. And I know Stephanie will be talking about that today as well. She's a frequent speaker at business events and on the radio. She's been featured in a variety of magazines, including Business Week, Inc., Wired, and Entrepreneur. So with that, let's just jump right in. And I should let everyone know that the um, Nonfiction Authors Association is a dot com, and you can go there, and there is a free membership. Jump on board and get involved. And um, and with that, let's just let's just go with Stephanie. First of all, welcome to Author You, your guide to book publishing. Thanks so much for inviting me, Judith. It's great to be here. Good. I go. I'm thrilled to have you. I mean, you know, as one of member one of the, one of the members of your community, <laughs> that yeah. that uh, you know, I I think it's always important. I mean, this whole publishing scenario has just changed, 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 changed. And I know I just put to bed, sent to the printers this week my new book, How to Avoid 101 Book Publishing Blunders, Bloopers, and Boo Boos. And I'm already thinking, oh, my God, I forgot. I left this one out. I left this one out. I should have had this one in here because it does does keep changing. And it's so different from the way it was when I first sold my book to St. Martin's Press back in 1980. Oh, yeah, lots of change. Sure. Actually, lots has lots has happened in the last five years, and it continues to evolve um, almost on a daily basis. I think, yeah, um, on those areas. So, why don't we uh, kind of take a look at um, uh, that? Most people, I, I'm always amazed when I hear this. They absolutely don't feel that they can make a living writing books, selling books, speaking about books, and I, you know, I've certainly done it for thirty years. Um, that and I know you can, but it takes a plan and it does take a strategy to do that. So sure. how you know how do you deal with some of the uh, some of the lower profit margins? And I what I really see is low profit margins that come in with the the print on demand variety because they don't realize there is a higher cost if you choose the print on demand route. By the time you get books and everything and the resale, right? So you're asking how. How do you deal with the higher cost, or how do you deal with the profit? Well, I, I think that that they struggle with revenue generation. Let's just start with yeah. that. If okay, a struggle yeah. With revenue it, so what path do we go down? Well, this was frustrating for me early on as well, and um, I started kind of poking around. I, I didn't publish my first book till 2005, and at that time, I thought, wow, books don't make much money, right? And and if you're traditionally published, as you know, you make a dollar, two dollars a copy if you're lucky. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, that is if you're lucky. When I start telling authors, I'm saying, so you're going to have a fifteen dollar book. They're going to discount. In fact, in fact, when I sign contracts, uh, all my contracts are um, the ten. Per, you know, your first five thousand books are ten percent. The next five are twelve and a half, and then anything over ten is fifteen percent. That they were all based, Stephanie, on the retail price. 
right. the right. retail price. And Mine it was too. Simon and Schuster who off the wall decided, you know what, we're going to change the game. We're going to net. <laughs> yeah. So, so now you're talking 80 and 90 cents sometimes, or yeah. if it's a trade paper, it could be 47 cents. That's all you're going to make if it's with and a even traditional on your e-book. publisher. I mean, which oh, yes. just infuriates me because you can't, you can't even distribute your own ebook if you're traditionally published and you're making pennies per sale, which is just outrageous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. So the alternative scenario is? Yeah, is to really produce online revenue streams. So back when, when I got my first book published, I had built a website to reach my target audience. It was a business startup book. The website was Business Info Guide, and I thought, well, I have all these people coming to my website. I'd like to sell them something. So I was noticing that other websites were selling downloadable products, you know, Mm -hmm. downloadable databases and worksheets and things like that, and I thought, well, I want to do that. And And I always go straight to the bookstore. Where can I find a book on how to do this? And there wasn't one. So I had to study how other people were selling their products. And back then, an ebook was a PDF, right? And so Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. I started selling these things on my own on my website. They started selling immediately. And I thought, wow, you know, once you have an audience that's interested in what your, you know, what your expertise is, then you can produce products and services to sell to them. So I started doing that. And then I wrote another book, which was From Entrepreneur to Infopreneur. That was published with Wiley back in 06. And it was all about how do you produce these online revenue streams. And since then, I have, you know, played around with these for over a decade. And like you, I've earned a really great living doing what I love by creating things online. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you, you always stayed, I mean, you and I do have similar paths. So, and, and, and how long did you stay with Wiley? I, that was the only book I published with Wiley, and th- what happened was that as soon as my book came out, my editor left, and then my next book was a uh, a book for authors, which was not a fit for Wiley. My agent sold that one to Quill Driver, and then we sold another book to Career Press. So it was, and and during that process, I got really turned off by traditional publishing. I mean, we just mm-hmm. talked about how pitiful the earnings are. And then I really didn't like losing control. You know, I'm a, I'm a type A person. I'm an entrepreneur. And the, the final straw for me was when the publisher called and said, uh, we want you to cut a chapter from the book. We don't care which one, but we're trying to cut back on costs. And I, you've got to be kidding me, right? And there was no care about the quality. I turned it into lemonade. I ended up taking the final chapter, which was a resources chapter, and making it a free download from the website if the reader registered. So, you know, I I, tur- I spun that into gold, but I was so turned off. I've had book covers I didn't like. You know, the, the publishers, as you well know, can can take all kinds of liberties. They can remove content. They can replace things. They can change your title. I've had that happen. So I took back control and uh, and began publishing my own books after that. Well, I, I have told people over the years of the 18 books, can't believe I did 18 with New York, because I am a recovered New York publishing snob, Stephanie. Yeah. I mean, I am very open about that. I, I, you know, grew up to believe the only legitimate author is published with New York, and that's just such BS, but that uh, at least today it is, today it is, and that, that with that, I would say there's only two covers I liked. Of all of those covers that I did with yeah, New York, I don't, there's I only believe it. two, and it, and when authors don't get, I mean, there's this egos get involved, and there's this belief that if I'm not published with a New York t- imprint, and as soon as they learn that word, they'll use that. If I'm not published with a New York imprint, you know, it, it's not legitimate, or I won't have the credibility, which is absolutely nonsense. I mean, when is the last time you picked up a book and said, ah? Oh, what another fine book by Simon and Schuster. I mean, really, I mean, it's just, right, you, just, exactly. you, just, you just don't do it that way. So it's, it's really looking in that direction. Um, and, and how do you do it? Um, but do it right. Because, and that's what you and I do. We see these God awful mistakes that are repeated day in and day yeah. out. And you wonder, there's so much information. How do they keep stumbling? 
Uh, you know, I mean, I sometimes I wonder that there's so much information out there to show you the paths on which way to do it. That how do you get sucked down the, these rabbit holes? Yeah, there's sometimes. a lot of corners being cut. Has been my I think that's my number one gripe about people who self-publish. They don't get enough editing. They don't get quality cover design. You know, those things make such an important impact. And years back, I owned a bookstore. That was my mm. career in 03. I opened a brick-and-mortar bookstore here in Sacramento. And every day, authors walked in with their books, wanting to get them placed in the store. And that is when my frustration began with self-publishing and where my perception of it grew into, this is not a good avenue. And since then, obviously, my opinion has changed as well. But I saw so many poorly produced books and authors didn't want the feedback, and, you know, they're doing things on a shoestring. Well, guess what? This is this is your only chance to make a first impression, and if you don't make that, you lose the sale, you lose the interest of the bookstore, you, you know, you don't get books for speaking, people don't buy your stuff. So mm-hmm. I agree. I think quality, if you're going to self-publish, quality has to be the biggest priority of all. Yeah, and it, it certainly is for me, and, and I, I think I mentioned this, though, a week or two ago on the show, but, you know, Amazon, and I think, and I'm going bravo, is doing a crackdown. If they're getting, if they start getting complaints, they put it into effect um, a month ago, if, that, if they start getting complaints about bad editing, quality of a book, et cetera, and there are multiples, they will put a banner up and suspend your sales until you fix it. Did you know that? I did. I think it's wonderful. And yeah, I'll tell you, I'm even the big it. New York publishing houses, I'm a big Kindle reader, and I get really frustrated with the um, the typos in the books and with the formatting on Kindle. I mean, that is not rocket science, and a lot of the big New York houses aren't getting it right. So I'm glad Amazon has imposed that policy and that we can report errors now. Yeah, but yeah, I'm all for it. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, but here's what I want to do when we come back. Let's talk about um, creating those different streams and that, and also you and I are both huge supporters of getting sponsors. So let's yeah. talk about how do we seek and find them and hook up with them, pitch to them, and those kind of things. This is Judith Bryles. My guest today is Stephanie Chandler, and we're talking about creating your success. We'll be right back. is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Give your book the best shot at getting buzz before it's even released. JKS Communications has been leading the book publicity industry for more than a decade. From producing some of the earliest book trailers to recently creating what Shelf Awareness calls the world's longest book tour, our team of publicists work tirelessly, smart, and with the goal of getting you the best attention possible. Our family of publicists come from journalism and publishing backgrounds with great experience and a passion for books. And our family of authors all across the globe are supportive of one another. We read your book and talk to you to understand your goals and lifestyle before sending you a proposal. We only represent books and authors that we believe in. Let's get going. Go online at jkscommunications.com. Is there a book in you or another Author You will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being good. If you already have a book out, you'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author You brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author You's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author You is for you. 
If you're a hobbyist or a casual author, it's not. Join Author U today through its website at authoru.org. Follow Author U on Twitter at Author U and on Facebook at Author U, where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily. Author U, where the author goes to become seriously successful. First impressions are everything in the world of book publishing. Whether your book is an ebook, a print version, or both, your book cover needs to pop, sizzle, and sparkle to immediately capture the attention of your audience. And your book's interior needs to be just as dynamic and reflect the professionalism your readers demand. Nick Selinger of NZ Graphics has won numerous national and international book awards for his cover designs and interior layouts. With over 20 years of experience in graphic design, he knows what it takes to create award-winning books and the many promotional pieces that authors need, such as posters, banners, postcards, one-sheets, business cards, logos, and more. Visit ncgraphics.com and see what authors and publishers have to say about their award-winning books and how NZ Graphics can make your book the success it was meant to be. That's nzgraphics.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with me is Stephanie Chandler, and we're going to be going through a series of scenarios of where you can become more successful or enhance what you're currently doing. And just a quick reminder that she puts together an annual event called the Nonfiction Writers Conference every year. It's all online. You participate online. You can get information by going to the nonfictionwritersconference.com. The dates are May 4th through 6th. And if you're registered, that you can come back and, and, you know, listen to the interviews with a huge variety of experts um, in fields on it. So with that said, uh, let's talk about the, I, I mentioned as we took the break, Stephanie, that, uh, that you've had a lot of expense, experience in getting corporate sponsorship, um, and, yep. and which adds to the revenue streams uh, very attractively. You can you can actually cover the entire cost of a book if you work. I've done this a couple of times, so let's let's jump into that. What are some of the tips and tricks to seek out sponsors, to pitch to them, to negotiate with them, to contract with them? Yeah, I, so this is one of my absolute favorite revenue streams because the the money is usually really good, and the the bottom line is that sponsors, big companies want access to your audience. So the key here is that you're building an audience. This is another reason why platform is so important. It's not just about book sales, but it's about being attractive to a sponsor. They they call us influencers. That's the industry term. So, for example, Yahoo wants to reach people in small business, and they work with small business influencers who are authors, bloggers, speakers, people who have a large presence online. So for me, I started out working with the small business community, and I've had a ton of sponsorships over the years. I've been paid for Twitter chats and webinars. Um, I I had a a sponsor, a company that paid me $1,000 a month for years to sponsor a single blog post on my own website every month. All I had to do was write the post I was going to write anyway, put the sponsors, you know, a little promotional blurb at the bottom of the post, and then share it across social media. And it's ridiculous how easy that was. I had a, a six-figure sponsorship as a spokesperson for a company, which involved me traveling there twice in a year, giving a, a couple of webinars, and doing some social media stuff with them. I did a, a, a radio tour for them as a spokesperson. It was an extremely small amount of my time for a, a very large paycheck. So sponsorship, I think, should be on every author's goal list. 
if you're focused on building your audience, then think about what companies want to reach your audience. You know, let's say you've written a book about aging gracefully. Maybe you want to work with Dove. You know, Dove has all these great initiatives for women or Oil of Olay or, you know, a company like that. So you want to figure out who matches up with your audience and then approach those companies and see if you can find a way to work together. Stephanie, who is the idea? I mean, I actually had also one of those six-figure um, deals where I was a spokesperson for Bristol Myers for three years in one of their products um, and wrote a book for them. We they sponsored the the uh, study for the book. They they bought they pre bought twenty five thousand copies. They used for premium distribution. They paid to have me out on the platform speaking. All I had to do was mention the product a couple times. We did. I mean, it, it was it was fun. It was fun. Yep. Um, to do that, so it, but it wasn't easy work. It was hard work, and I was doing media. I was I would do uh, satellite TV tours uh, yep, for I them. Yep, I did that too. Yep, but it, it it number one, it teaches you how to pitch. That's for sure, and that uh, and and get your message concise and succinctly <laughs> and across the board. But it's it's in and those things change. So if you were to uh, and they came to me, I have to tell you that I didn't go to them. They came and found me. So who would you reach out to and how would you suggest someone go about uh, connecting in that area? Yeah, you know what's incredibly cool today is LinkedIn advanced search. This has to be one of my favorite tools. So on LinkedIn, there's an advanced search feature where you can search by all different kinds of parameters. You can search by company name. You can search by title as a person within a company you can search by keywords. So let's say you want to reach the, um, the VP of marketing in charge of the Office Depot back to school campaign. I'm making this up, right? But sure. Got so it. you'd go in and you'd search Office Depot, marketing, VP, and in keywords you'd put back to school campaign. And you'd be surprised how much detail is on people's LinkedIn profiles and that you'll actually find the person in charge of that campaign. And this is really important when you're working with big companies because they have so many divisions and different initiatives and their marketing department might be 100 people deep. So it's usually the marketing department that's making these decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you find them on LinkedIn, you can either pick up the phone and call that person and ask for them by name or you can get their email address and send them an email. You can use LinkedIn mail to send a message but this stuff really works, and it's easier than ever to reach people. Now, you have to, for that, using the advanced search, or, and correct me if I'm wrong, do you need to be a paid member in LinkedIn and not the freebie side? Not to use advanced search. It's totally free. You do totally if, you free. Want to send okay. a, if you want to send a LinkedIn message. You have mm-hmm. to be a premium user. I think it's 30 bucks a month or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have absolutely used those premium messages. Not everybody checks their LinkedIn mail, but it's a good starting point. Another thing you can do is go back to Google and figure out what the company's email structure is. A lot of times it's first name dot last name at company dot com, and all you have to do is find one other person in that company and see what their email format is, and then send an email. You know, email pitches I think are they're my personal favorite way to send a pitch because I I prefer email. I rarely answer my phone unless I know who's calling. <laughs> So, you know, send a great email pitch, and that pitch should be um, short and sweet and really uh, get them excited and interested. You know, the other thing I've noticed, Judith, is that um, PR firms that handle these companies need ideas. And I've been contacted by PR firms a number of times for these opportunities. And basically what PR firms do is get on Google and look for, you know, an expert in a field but you can also be pitching the PR firm that, that's in charge of Procter & Gamble or, you know, whoever it is you're trying to reach. Send them a pitch because it's their job to bring fresh ideas to their clients. And if you've got a – and give them an idea. Give them fresh ideas. You know, I want to start a blog series um, about your products or, you know, something different, a Twitter chat about the wonders of your product and send them that pitch, you're going to get their attention if you have a big audience. 
Did I lose you? I'm here. Does it make sense to uh, do a pitch that is directed in incorporating, like you mentioned, you know, the Twitter chat or a blog, uh, you know, a series of blogs? And I love the idea of, of having that tag with their sponsorship. I mean, that would be buku to write one blog and get a thousand dollars. I'd love that. Yeah. But, but to um, to incorporate your pitch in that the with a, a, a hook with social media versus definitely you're out and running because that's what they're looking for so much today. They really are. You know, social media for the people who still fear it, the reality uh-huh. is it's not going away and no. influencers care about this. So do literary agents. I mean, everyone cares about your social media platform. Mm-hmm. So we do need mm-hmm. to embrace it and make that part of your pitch. When I send a pitch, I like to send, you know, a handful of ideas here are some potential ways we can work together. And I'll put, you know, four or five bullets of, you know, we can do Twitter chats. We could do webinars that educate your audience. And in the, here's a sentence on why, you're, why I reach your audience and how I can help you. Because you're making it about them, right? How are you going to help them reach their audience? Well, that's exactly. You're easing their pain. And by the way, when you mentioned PR firms, that's how I was contacted. The PR yeah. firms found me. So, you know, what we need to say every, to everybody is you need to make sure you go back and revisit your profiles and make sure they clearly identify your expertise. On LinkedIn, absolutely. LinkedIn is a, a power tool, and I think a lot of authors are missing that. Even if your target audience for your books isn't on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a very business-focused audience. The fact is that um, major companies are searching for speakers on LinkedIn. They're searching for business opportunities. You know, you want your profile filled out as completely as possible. In my past life, I worked in the Silicon Valley. I was a, a technical instructor and course developer. It was actually my favorite job I ever had of you know, of collecting a paycheck. But that past experience combined with my work with entrepreneurs in recent years led to... Let's, let's come back and revisit that. Let me come oh, back okay. Break. okay. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Want to publish like a pro today? Well, then take a look at Ingram Spark, the only publishing platform that offers print and ebook services through a single source. Upload, edit, and manage titles all in one place. Take more control of printing costs with print on demand and reach even more readers through one of the world's most extensive distribution networks. Built by independent publishers for independent publishers, Ingram Spark has everything you need. Need to maximize your book's potential, color printing, ebook distribution, print on demand, global reach, and more. Start publishing with Ingram Spark today and see just how far your titles will go tomorrow. That's IngramSpark.com. Many of us have dreamed of writing a book. Some of us even have. Then the hard work starts. You'll need an editor. Who will design the cover or typeset the pages? Who will format the ebook? If you're a business owner, consultant, or coach with a serious message and expertise to share, the team of experts at 1106 Design can guide you through the maze. They've helped more than a thousand authors create top quality books and avoid the not so reputable self publishing companies. Learn more at 1106design.com. Then call Michelle at 602 866 3226. 1106 Design. Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972. They believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. 
Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing question. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Okay, so before we took the break, and again, I'll remind everyone that Stephanie creates her annual Nonfiction Writers Conference, which is May 6th through uh, May 4th through the 6th, and you can get information at nonfictionwritersconference.com. And I would encourage you to participate. And also, if you know, if you would like to come to Denver in June, which is lovely, I do my own three-day conference, which is Judith Bryles Book Publishing Unplugged. And it's three days intense with me, where I am gonna show you from how to create bestseller campaigns to the crowdfunding campaigns to the deep dive drill downs that you're going to have to do. You are going to be every person who participates is in the hot seat till I get your pitch down so you can go out with confidence. And there's just so much more in the whole development and the marketing strategy. So that is going to be June 23rd through the 25th. All you have to do is go to the bookshepherd.com website and you'll find the details there under the events tab. So Stephanie and I were talking about, we've, been, we've really been focusing on some of the things that can happen with corporate sponsors because I am a huge believer in getting people to underwrite the things that you love. <laughs> and that could be involved with books. That could be involved with courses. That could be involved with just writing something. As Stephanie said, she had one client. She wrote a blog a month and got paid $1,000. I think that's hot. I'd love, to, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd love to do that. So, Stephanie, you were mentioning you had a relationship in, in a, with a software company. You have to name the company. But what did that all involve, and what did you take away from that? So the point I was trying to make is that with LinkedIn, when you fill out your profile completely, including your past work experience, that helps people when they're searching for somebody. And so what happened to me was, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I was in Silicon Valley. I was a software, um, I worked at a software company as a technical instructor, course developer. So that is in my work history on LinkedIn. Well, in, you know, the last 10 years, I've worked with entrepreneurs. So this combined experience led to me getting contacted by the directors of SCORE, the Service Corps of Retired Executives. Mm -hmm. They Mm -hmm. loved that I had this background in training, and they hired me to develop a course for them. Now, that wasn't something that would typically on my, be on my menu of services, but it was a wonderful opportunity. I enjoyed the project very much, and that came simply because my LinkedIn profile was filled out so completely. So the point I was trying to make is I hope you all really take time to make mm. sure your LinkedIn profile is robust. It's got lots of rich keywords and shares your work experience. Well, that's that's a great tip because most people think, well, I wrote, I, you know, I just write mystery, so therefore, I, you know, I'm not going on LinkedIn. Right. There may be, you, you know, you could be a master sleuther, and you, you may need, there may be something who needs, may needs to do competitive intelligence on something, and with your skills that you've used in creating your novels and things, you, you know, who knows? It just may be a fit. You just or you may get hired to 
to speak about how to write a mystery novel. I mean, you just you just don't know, and it takes such little effort to get that up and running. You don't have to spend an hour a day on LinkedIn. Get your profile filled out and pop in once a week, you know, to check on messages and accept new mm-hmm. contacts. Exactly. All right, so you just mentioned something, which opens up another window, that e- SCORE asked you to write a course. So what steps do, does, let's say, like, for example, I write nonfiction. What would a nonfiction author go about in the process of creating a course, whether they do it as a as a uh, uh, in-person presentation or they, they do it as a customized for a group that hires you to bring in or you create a virtual course? What are the components? What are the what are the commonalities, and what are the differences? Well, you know there are lots of opportunities to teach courses. You can sign on to be an instructor with Udemy or Lynda dot com. Those are great if you don't already have an audience built. But if you already have your own audience, I would do your own thing, your own course, your event. By the way, um, in June sounds fantastic. So, you know, what I would suggest is that you sit down and figure out. What does your audience most want to know? What can you teach them? A course is about teaching. And mm-hmm. by the way, online revenue streams are always about teaching something. So your course could be, uh, you know, a one-day live in-person workshop. It could be a six-week online program that people log into a webinar or teleseminar line. You can create a self-study course. I'm in the process right now of creating a 12-part um, author marketing course, it's like mind-numbing how much effort this is taking. But, I know, um, I know. But I, when I sat down to figure out what do people want to know, the list got bigger and bigger and bigger. And basically the way I create a course is similar to how I create a book. I start with an outline. So I get all the topics together. And I like to use the old storyboard method with, Mm -hmm. you know, three-by-five cards. I write down every single minute detail or or topic I want to cover. I lay it out all before me. I start to put it in logical order. So that becomes modules for the course. And, And then, you know, right now I'm recording video presentations of each of these modules. So I think you really need to figure out, what your audience is most interested in. I've done lots of live courses in the past. Live courses mean that you have to, you know, schedule that out in your calendar. And I think there's a trend toward people wanting to learn on their own time. I personally like to download something, and when I have time, I'll listen to it or watch it or whatever. So self-study courses are a great option. And with courses, I really believe that you should um, provide handouts, give a lot of extra value, you know, if you're telling somebody to start tracking tracking their research or something like that, provide them a simple tracking worksheet. I mean, it, it's just kind of filling in those blanks to make it as easy as possible mm-hmm. for your audience. And mm-hmm. I personally love creating courses. It's a ton of fun. I could do it full time every day of the week. It's it's a lot of fun. Well, it's interesting you say when we're we're doing um, this year's Judith Bryles Book Publishing Unplugged, we're going to video the whole thing with the cool. specific intent of turning it into that virtual online course um, that people can pick up and take and, and come through. Because I actually have almost a 200-page workbook I create yeah. um, and add to it that everyone gets. When they have that. So, you know, it's all together. It's just uh, what we call repackaging, repurposing. And and you put it out that you could all of a sudden maybe have some what I call mailbox money come in um, and pick it up. And, and all of uh, all of our listeners really need to pay attention to this because there may be times when, you know, you 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 won't be producing a book every year or every other year or however you go about content. I mean, I used to be on the road where I was in, you know, a dozen different states every month speaking on my expertise in my books. Well, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't want to live on United Airlines anymore. Right. So if I can do it from my home base, and the microbe and go out once in a while, then that works. 
So with that, so th- everyone think about that. How do you create those? And so, so what vehicles are you using? Would you recommend using to to develop that platform off? And are we just going to land it on the website? Or you mentioned doing uh, a, c- a couple of the online courses, Udemy and uh, Linda. I think is that the ones you mentioned. There's Linda and Udemy where you can sign up to be an instructor for them, and you do a revenue split with them. That wouldn't mm-hmm. be my favorite way. Those are lower cost platforms. And they're good if you don't yet have an audience. It's a great way for you to start gaining some experience. But if you're going to do your own course, there's um, a service called Kajabi. I think it's K-I-J-A-B-I that has a kind of a a cool platform. You just plug all your content into it, and it makes it really easy for people to follow along. It's kind of like an online course in a box. I mean, they've got the website components. The, the, the e-commerce components are all built in there. Uh, it's pretty cool. I've attended Kajabi courses before. I'm personally putting my course together on my own site. I already have a membership program built into my site, so when somebody mm-hmm. signs up for the course, they'll get that membership level, which takes them directly to the, the course pages that are only available to course participants. And I'm you know, recording uh, basically webinar videos and providing, I think there's over 40 handouts. It's crazy how many handouts I've been working on. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of ways to facilitate it. I've also done live live classes are are really fun. You could do a weekly course for an hour that's by teleseminar. You know, I love instant teleseminar is a great tool. Or you could do it as a webinar, you know, with GoToMeeting, uh, Mm -hmm. something like that. And that's a fun way to interact with your students and, and give them homework each week that you review. I mean, there's lots of ways to add value to that. Yeah, you know, for everyone that I do a a live, uh, also I, I do it in person, how to write a book in four weeks, but I do it uh, virtual also. And we kicked off the April class last night. And I, I keep, you know, I keep it small because it's live, it's interactive, and we really work on it. Uh, to bring that out and it's it, it and it is fun it is very fun and you always have amazing little surprises that come along that really um, add to to the excitement sometimes <laughs> as as well as it opens up windows all right we're going to come back with stephanie chandler and what i want to go into is also um more about information products and how about building online communities for those followers that you're building. This is Judith Bryles. It's all through you, your guide to book publishing. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd. If you want to create a book with no regrets, give her a call today. 303 303- 885-2207. That's 303-885-2207. Or email her at Judith at Bryles.com. By the way, Bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at my book shepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd.
One of the most important decisions you will ever make is your choice for printing your book. You are choosing a company which will be responsible for guiding you through the process and printing your book at a level of quality and detail that embraces your personal and creative needs. You want to choose a company that when your book finally arrives, you are delighted and ready to move on to the next level and one that is customer focused. Choose King Printing Company and Addy Books to be that company that brings you to the next level. Go to kingprinting.com or call 978-458-2345 and ask for Tom Campbell. At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years' experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types, including side sewing. We provide warehousing, kitting, distribution, inventory management, a new print-on-demand facility, streaming browser-based ebooks, and bookstore. Call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project. You can also visit our website at www.tps1.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, so our final segment with Stephanie Chandler, who is the visionary of the nonfiction writersconference.com, and I would encourage you all to participate uh, May 4th through 6th of this year. And it's all online. It's all virtual. You can watch it live or you can pick up the videos post. Isn't that correct, Stephanie? Yeah, you, it's all teleseminars. So you can listen in live, ask questions of the um, speakers or download the recordings or transcripts. It's a lot mm-hmm. of fun. Yeah, it is fun. All right. And I have listened in before. So with that said, let's um, let's let's kind of focus on the we've got products we're going to develop, uh, you know, that we've got we've our followers. And I, I think that we, we should probably really kiss on the whole idea of developing a community that is really more informal or more formalized than versus just let's just email with each other that, to really bring them together. So what how do you build online communities? And, and what well, do they I look love, like? Yeah, and you're a community builder, too. I'm a community builder. I love community. I think it's a big missed opportunity for authors. So if you can figure out and really get clear about who your target audience is, and then you can build a community that brings them together. The easiest way today to do that is with a group either on Facebook or LinkedIn, um, you, I know you have a really active group, Judith, on LinkedIn. We have one as well. And Facebook groups are um, just really powerful as, also because you're bringing people together. You're, you're conversing with them on a regular basis. They're getting to know who you are. Therefore, they're going to be interested in every new book you release, new classes you offer, new you know, products that you make available. So you can have a free community and you can also have a paid community. Communities um, can be everything from, you know, you could create an, an uh, allergy club, maybe, and people subscribe to learn about how to manage their child's uh, food allergies. You know, you can just think about any kind of topic where you can bring some value. One of my favorite examples recently is John Lee Dumas. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Judith, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. he's got a, a very popular podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire, and He decided to launch his own community for podcasters, people who wanted to get into podcasting. So it's called Podcasters Paradise. It's largely built around, I believe it's a Facebook group, 
but they also have a back end where there's video tutorials and things like that. He charges $99 a month, and guess how much he's making on a monthly basis with his community and his sponsors? It's, it's like mind-blowing. He's, <laughs> oh, he's making over $400,000 a month. Oh, my gosh. Community. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Talk about inspiring. So he's got a $99 a month program. He has a number of sponsors. He actually publishes his monthly revenues on his website. I think it's entrepreneuronspire.com if you want to go look at that. And so he breaks it all down where his, his money is coming from. And his membership is incredible. So he's a real likable guy. He's out there in the podcasting community. Podcasting is hot right now. So um, there's just so much potential for structuring a, a community in any number of ways. Well, and I and I think it's just smart to do. So you find your like, you know, what your passion is about, what you really like to do, and you go out and you just you start calling them in. But you right. you want to offer them something. You've got to offer them something. There's got to be a reason because, as you and I know, there are a zillion author communities. There are a zillion writing communities. There are a zillion publishing relating communities, which is where you and I hang out. Uh, on. So what separates you? Um, you know, what exactly. do you have besides your personality? What else do you have that you become the go-to person to go, you know, hang out, stay yeah. in place, come back to, you know? Yeah, there has I'm, to be a good, a good value yeah. proposition, right, for somebody, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing a paid community. And even with the free communities, I mean, you know, I, I'm a member of lots of groups on LinkedIn and Facebook. Do I participate in all of them? And no, because right. I don't see the value or I haven't connected yet. So you've got to really pull people in and show them what the value is. Mm -hmm. and, and the issue is, you know, you did you did hit it that there, there are, uh, you and I are both on LinkedIn, that there are a lot of communities out there and, you know, that you've now been in more than 50. And if I look at maybe three or four, that's about all, all I have time for because I, you know, I have a pretty full day every day. So you can't do that much, but maybe you can drop in once a week and just see what's going on. I think that you have to be careful that it doesn't become that giant sucking sound and all of a sudden you've got several hours gone and then you're thinking, oh, I'm not going to go back again because I can't do that kind of time thing. So you've, you've got to, you, you got to seek and find what's the right fit for you and then participate and and give to it. I mean, that's the way I kind of feel. Absolutely. Yeah, get involved and be be a resource. That's, I think, the main yes. thing, is, especially in the nonfiction world. We really have to serve our audience. It's not about us. It's about what our audience needs. What are their challenges? Mm -hmm. What are their, mm -hmm. you know, interests? That's where the focus is. That's what makes you successful. Mm -hmm. And although there's a lot of the, the challenges are going to be repetitive over and over again, the interests will be repetitive over and over again, but there are fresh ways to look at them or new yeah. voices to bring along that they need to hear. I mean, that's the way I would look at it. All right, Les, I wanted to ask you about, um, what about advertisers? You know, how are those different from sponsors? Well, if you start getting some significant traffic on your website, the, the mm -hmm. easiest way to get advertisers is with become a Google ad you know, placement, and you put the ads up on your site, and you can earn some definite money from those. If you probably notice, every website you go to has Google ads. I was on a site the other day; the ads were so heavy, I couldn't even read the article. I clicked right off of it. So, you know, you want to do it in a tasteful, careful way. But that is one revenue stream. If you're generating lots of traffic to your site or your blog, uh, put some Google ads on there. You get paid monthly. It's a pretty fantastic opportunity. You can also sell ads directly. You know, you can sell banner ads to your sponsors. You can make that part of your sponsor packet. I'll promote you on my website. I'll put an ad for you in my sidebar. So there are ways to put advertising, you can put advertising in your books. I, I have an author friend who sells ads at the back of his books. He, sell, he writes technology books and uh, puts placements in the back of his books. You know, readers don't care and he makes the money and that gets more funds to publish those books. So, you know, think creatively. Companies have budgets and they need to spend them. <laughs> so, you know, look for ways that they'll, they'll pay to put a, 
a, a banner up at your live event. You know, it's crazy what they'll pay to do. So let me ask you this. Uh, let me go back to the Google ads. I mean, banner ads, you can pick and choose, cherry pick who would you want on that. Um, Google ads, do you get to pick and choose who comes on your site? I mean, and I would have to tell you, that would be a big alarm for me. I mean, the last thing I'd want to see is all of a sudden, yeah, I, was, I would be in Google ads and something, someone like Author Solution would show up. Which oh, I yeah, I hear you. Be opposed to. All right. So, that would be horrifying. Yeah, you can. <laughs> they've gotten so much better with this. You can actually eliminate. So you can take away um, advertisers and be really specific about who you don't want on there. And really, mm -hmm. the best way is, is mm -hmm. you know, to call them if you need instruction. They're, they're pretty good about helping you navigate this. Uh, mm -hmm. But but placing those ads on your site is so simple. They've made it really easy. And it used to be that those ads paid really well. I used to make quite a bit of money off my Google ads. Um, they've thinned out a little bit. But still, if you're getting traffic, it, it can really be worthwhile. All right. And so and what kind of traffic do you need to demonstrate that would be worth their while or does it matter? It doesn't matter. They'll they'll You can set up a Google... AdWords account no matter what. And if mm -hmm. you have a really niche audience, you know, let me, for example, attorneys pay 5 to $10 per click, and you're getting compensated based on clicks on your website. So if you've got a really niche topic that has a high dollar uh, advertising spend, then you could make some really good money. So if, on the ad, so the payments come, if someone has an ad on your deal that it could be stagnant or it could be very active depending on how many times people click on it. Is that how the pay comes? Well, Google rotates the ads. So it's mm -hmm. not, typically not going to be the same ad twice. And they mm -hmm. optimize. So the ads that get the most clicks are going to show up there more often. All right. Well, I think that's, that's a worthwhile to consider. All right. Any last thing you'd like to share before we ring off already? The hour is up. You know, this all comes back to reasons to build your audience and know who your audience is. Get really clear about your target audience. I know it's harder for fiction authors. Carve something out of your book that that is a topic. If your book is set in the South, maybe you have a, a website about Southern living and then you tweet about, mm -hmm. you know, Southern recipes. So lots of fun ways to make money online. And there he is. And so it goes back to I have always tried to get authors to drill down who is their reader and it may not yeah. be someone like you but who is your reader and you go out and you reach out and you talk to them and with that thank you stephanie chandler for being with us have a great great conference coming up here next month and this is judith browse it's author you your guide to book publishing we'll be back with you next week part of your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host dr judith briles each week a variety